So, Webinar Wednesday. It is a pleasure to have everybody here. And as I mentioned, it is a huge pleasure to have the founder of Structure and Function, Sue Falzoni. Sue, please yeah. drop us some education nukes. Over to you. Awesome. I am fired up to talk about this topic. I, you know, a couple of things. One, like when I was even thinking about just naming my company or one of my companies, um, you know, my middle name is Ann, so Susan Ann Falsoni, S-A-F, and I was thinking, all right, S-A-F, S-A-F, like what kind of goes with those letters? And it just sort of came to me, structure and function, and I was like, that is the perfect name for my company. And then I turned, I figured no one knew my middle initial, you know, my middle name, Ann, so I was doing a little bit of research because I'm a big symbol person and kind of what does thing you know, what do things mean? And so, you know, I was just leaving Athletes Performance or now Exos, you know, I'd been there for 13 years and um, was just leaving the Dodgers, had been with them for six years. And I'm thinking, man, I might be committing career suicide here by leaving. But, you know, I just knew it was like the right time and, and for me to just kind of take a little sabbatical and figure out what I needed to do. And so... Um, the ampersand, that little and symbol, uh, I found somewhere that says it's a broken infinity sign, meaning that nothing truly lasts forever and there's always an and. And I thought that is very apropos for where I am in my career right now. And so that's kind of where the company name Structure and Function came from, was my initials and then the ampersand of, of there's always an and. And so, you know, it really... Structure and function are two things that I'm super passionate about because obviously living in the performance world, I'm so focused on function and and how people move and how people are moving. And yet I'm such an anatomy nerd as well and really feel like, you know, sometimes we skip over the structure portion of it. Sometimes we want to get right into the functional exercise or the functional activity. And yet you know, if we really kind of take the time to identify the pain generator, meaning, you know, what is bothering someone? Is it their tendon? Is it their bursa? Um, because those things matter, right? Like identifying the pain generator and making sure we know the tissue that is the issue, um, that that matters. And so that's really where the, the structure portion of it comes in is because I'm such an anatomy nerd. And then, you know, it's just straight like chicken or egg type stuff. Like does our structure dictate our function or does our function dictate our structure? And, and when an athlete walks in the door, you know, you can almost guess what type of an athlete they are. You know, it's like, oh, well, they've got the body type of a catcher or they've got, you know, that's a wide receiver right there or that's an offensive lineman. And so it's like, does their body type dictate what they end up being really good at? from a sport standpoint or do they get really good at a sport and then their body sort of morphs to fit that sport you know which way does it go and, and I'm not sure if we have an answer but I certainly like to to go back and forth and try to think about it and figure it out and, and relate one to the other um, so uh, we can go on let's see did you say you have control of the slides or I do, I do. you command me Sue and I will obey <laughs> okay um, so yeah, so basically that's all what I just said. Let's go to the, to the next one. Okay. Um, so again, kind of looking at our prehab uh, continuum and our rehab continuum, again, people have gotten so um, on the functional side of the house, which is fine. I'm not saying that's bad. Um, you know, back in the, in the 80s and 90s, I mean, I was practicing in the 90s, not in the 80s, but you know, back in the 90s, things were very, very anatomically oriented and very structure oriented. And then kind of as we got into the 2000s and, and later, people have gotten um, super functional with exercise. And, and I think that's good. I think that's okay. But I find that when I combine both paradigms, that's really when my athletes get 100% better versus 80% better. Um, you know, we kind of have different things, right? Like there's different phases in the continuum of when people are either rehabbing or performing. And for example, at some point, everybody gets core stability exercises, right? Everybody gets a core stabilization exercise. It doesn't matter if you have a disc issue. It doesn't matter um, if you have a facet issue. It doesn't matter what's going on. Everybody kind of gets core work, but yet 
everybody has different issues, right? So like I said, someone's got a disc issue, someone's got a facet issue, someone, you know, I just had an athlete yesterday come in that has ankylosing spinal, um, spondylosis. And so, you know, that's a different thing. And so how can we merge these two paradigms to really sort of let the pendulum kind of hang in the middle of them. Um, for me, that's really that's really kind of where the sweet spot is for me. It's kind of right there in the middle between the two. Um, go ahead, and we'll go next slide. Okay. And so, again, looking at how people function, right? So we've got our musculoskeletal system, which we're so used to talking about, and I think as strength coaches and performance coaches and physical therapists, we get so comfortable talking about the biomechanics of things, um, but we forget that it's a nervous system driven system. And so it's really our nervous system that drives uh, what the musculoskeletal system does. And so the sensory, it's, you know, the sensory motor system is really what it comes down to. If we have bad input, we're going to have bad output. So we have to make sure that that nervous system um, is really feeding the musculoskeletal system in the appropriate manner. And so it's right in that sort of sweet spot of when all of those things, the neurological system, the muscular skeletal system are really functioning optimally um, is where really we can make some amazing changes and awesome changes with our athletes. Next slide. Uh, go one more time. So as we're looking at the differences, so I'm going to kind of relate this stuff to, to the um, cervical, thoracic, and lumbar spine just because I think that's an interesting place to sort of talk about structure and function. Um, but we certainly can go in any direction, you know, that people want to go. But looking at the anatomy of stuff, you know, the cervical spine versus the thoracic spine versus the lumbar spine, those are three really different looking uh, structures and they're made for different things. So when we look at the cervical spine, it has a really, really small vertebral body. Um, it's got the set joints that are um, in the transverse plane. Sorry, there's like a really annoying truck going by. Hopefully that didn't. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. I'm like, the entire world needs to stop driving so I can do my uh, webinar. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, looking at that cervical spine, really, really tiny vertebral body, right? Because it doesn't need to hold a lot of weight, right? It just has the weight of our head, basically. Um, the facet joints there are in the transverse plane. So the cervical spine is set up really, really nicely for rotation. Um, whereas as we start to look down into the thoracic spine and into the lumbar spine, now the lumbar spine has a really big vertebral body. Um, and so that has to hold the, you know, basically the entire weight of our body. Um, and so as we look at the facet joints, right, going to the thoracic spine, those are now more in the frontal plane. So the T-spine is set up anatomically really, really well for side bending. And then as we look again at the facet joints in the lumbar spine, you can't even really see those because they're in the sagittal plane. And so the lumbar spine is set up really, really nice for flexion and extension. And so as we look at all three of the vertebrae, when we put those things together, that's what really combines our amazing 3D motion that we have at the spine. Um, and that's really what the spine needs to do. The spine needs to have controlled mobility. I think we get we get so wrapped up in the concept of core stability. And I say that, I use that word all the time, and, and I use exercises that I think fall into that category. But if the spine was really meant to be stable, it'd be one big long bone. And it's not. It's, it's, it's 24 movable parts that really need to have controlled mobility. And when you put the amazingness of rotation in the C-spine together with the side bending of the thoracic spine, together with the flexion and extension of the lumbar spine, we get unbelievable degrees of movement throughout the spine that um, we really need to be able to foster as healthcare professionals and people who are intervening um, with, with these people. So as we go to the next slide, um, you know, we look at, we look at posture and, and again, I love function and I love movement and I don't mean to kind of keep going back to static things. However, 
I feel like it's really important to know where we're starting from. You know, I, I can't, I, I can't get, I can't tell someone directions on how to get to the LAX airport if I don't know where they're starting from, right? Like when someone says, how do I get to the airport? You've got to know where they're starting from. And so that's how posture relates to movement. If you don't know where a person is starting from, or if they're starting from a really inefficient position, they're going to have inefficient movement. And so as I was studying some of the DNS stuff, the, the Pavel Collage, Czech Republic, um, you know, Prague school stuff, Pavel said something that I thought was really interesting um, a long, long time ago. This was probably eight years ago, but it stuck with me as far as like, what is good posture? And he really defined it as an amazing co-activation of things and a, a co-activation of our flexors and extensors, a co-activation of our internal and external rotators and a co-activation of our AB and AD ductors. And when everything's sort of co-activating and the body is living in an awesome state of homeostasis, the body's really happy. It's when, go ahead to the next slide. It's when things get out of balance um, is that is when things get angry, right? That's when tissue gets angry. And so as we look at this, he calls it the old system. So if we think about when a child is born, right? Like a baby is born and they're in this like little ball. They're all flexed up, they're all adducted, and they're just in this tiny little ball. And so it's not until their sensory system hears or sees their mom or hears a, an interesting noise that they begin to lift their head up or track their eyes, right? Once their vision comes into focus, they start to kind of track and they see different things. And that's when their extensors begin to activate. That's when their external rotators begin to activate. And that's when their abductors begin to activate. When they see something or hear something in the world or they feel something, that's when sort of the new system begins to become active. And so um, when we look at anything, right, think about when your arm hurts you, what do you do? You hold it to your side. Um, if you are tired, what do you do? You slump over. If you're fearful, right, if you're nervous, you kind of come into yourself a little bit. Um, you know, if you've had a stroke or some type of a neurological incident, um, you know, that pattern goes into flexion, internal rotation, and adduction. So it's not that I never train those patterns. Of course I do. It's just that we have to train the new system more, and we have to train the new system um, more so than the old system because everything we're wired to do takes us back to that old system. And so that's really where our training methods and our postural education and those things really need to focus on the new system. Go ahead to the to the next line. Um, so Bruger, um, gosh, I can't exactly remember his title. I think he's a neurophysiologist um, from Germany, but he makes a really, really. He's either from Germany or Austria. I kind of I can't remember exactly where he's from, but um, really interesting concept of his cogwheels, right? So as everyone's sitting here listening to the webinar go ahead and just slouch over for me. Um, and you feel how when you slouch, your head comes forward, right? Your shoulders round. Now don't think about anything but your lumbar spine. Just sort of arch your lumbar spine up. And what happens? Your head comes back, your shoulders come back. Everything kind of aligns themselves back over the spine. And so that's really where his concept of the cogwheels come into play. As we talked about earlier, the spine is not one big long bone. It's 24 movable parts. And so when we have an issue in one area, it's going to create what Lewitt describes as these nociceptive chains, right? So as we begin to slouch and our head comes forward, we get some tightness in our upper trapezius, our mid back begins to hurt, then our low back starts to hurt. And then, you know, or if we go the other way, we get really, really too arched and then we shift our weight. All these different things happen because everything is super connected. And so we begin to create these different chains. And, and lately I've been studying some of, um, uh, Luigi Stecco's fascial manipulation work. And he really defined some interesting myofascial units or myofascial lines that go together that interestingly enough, it, you know, kind of brought me back to this concept of nociceptive chains and how everything gets connected. Um, 
And same thing from a structural standpoint, um, you know, as we're looking at fossil work right now, um, there's some really interesting stuff coming out that we're not breaking up cross links. We're not trying to break up adhesions. We're simply trying to elevate the temperature of some hyaluronic acid in between the different fascial layers. And if we can increase that temperature, we, oh, come on, garbage truck. This was a Get cool away, clean. garbage truck. Damn you, garbage truck. Go away. Oh, it's a loud one, too. <laughs> He's going away. He's going away. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so we're, we're changing the temperature of the hyaluronic acid, which really sort of changes the viscosity of the fluid in between the tissues. And that's really what sort of helps from a myofascial standpoint. So these concepts of these different chains, be it myofascial units or, or nociceptive chains is really interesting to me because structurally everything is connected. So we have to deal with that from a functional standpoint when we are addressing different issues. Next slide. Next slide. Mm. So my point here is that posture can be trained, right? So despite the fact that this guy has had a nice body comp change, um, he has an unbelievable postural change, right? In that first picture on the left, his head is super forward. And, you know, and I don't know the the Newton meters of force as, as things get, you know, changed. But, but when we have a forward head like that versus his positioning on the right, he is so much more balanced and so much more aligned. And he is someone who was throwing a football for a living. And so, you know, shockingly, he was having some shoulder pain. So once we sort of realign, we didn't necessarily change his structure, right? I didn't change the actual anatomical lordosis that he has in his lumbar spine or the anatomical, um, you know, kyphosis that he has at, at the thoracic spine, but we changed the way he sort of positioned that structure. And so that alone took a ton of tension off the musculoskeletal structures at the upper trapezius, at the neck, at the cervical spine, um, and at the shoulder and really helped to decrease his pain. And so we could work on better movement for him to return him to his sport. Um, but we really had to address his postural stuff because you cannot outwork bad posture. I cannot come up with a set and rep scheme that will combat the 23 hours a day that he's not with me and he looks like the picture on the left. I can't combat that with a set rep scheme. So I have to do some education with him and to truly train his postural endurance muscles he needs to work on them from an endurance standpoint. He has to be working on that posture and on his position constantly throughout the day with different reminders and different cues that remind him like, oh, yep, I need to, okay, where's my shoulder? Where's my head? How am I sitting? How am I holding myself? And so, you know, you can have different cues for people where, you know, if they're sitting at their computers, I always tell people to change their screensaver. So, it, you know, it comes up with like sit up or, you know, whatever it is or, um, you know, if they're on their phone, there's a red dot on their phone. So they have to, if they go to answer the phone, they've got to stand up so they can kind of get out of their, you know, whatever posture they are, or they have to walk around while they're talking on the phone. They can't just sit. And so just some simple, easy cues that you can give people to help them kind of remind and cue into their positioning, I think is helpful throughout the day. Mm -hmm. Next slide. So thoracic spine. Next one. Mm -hmm. By next one, yes. Okay. So again, going into the structure of that T spine, and you know, those of you who've listened to to some of my audio lectures or whatever, like I love the thoracic spine, and really, it came out of a function of I was, you know, doing so, a lot of lecturing, and everybody was talking about core stability, core stability, core stability, and I was like, I am so sick of this freaking topic of core stability. Um, let's look up like there's a whole thoracic spine and there's a whole cervical spine and there's a whole like there's a way more stuff we can be talking about other than lumbar spine and so i just did like a talk on thoracic spine one day years ago and it just exploded and people um which was really really cool to see and so i love the thoracic spine because quite frankly i feel like it is the root of so many things that can go wrong so you know 
not to get too woo woo, but right, like our heart is contained in our thoracic cage and our lungs. And like, that's like the center of where our life comes from, right? So from a woo woo standpoint, the thoracic spine is really cool. Um, that's where our sympathetic nervous system lives, right? And so when you think about, you know, if you've, if you've heard the term craniosacral therapy, right? Craniosacral therapy really, and, and I'm not trained in cranial, cranial sacral therapy, so I don't, I don't mean to speak to the, to the technique, but, but relating it to the nervous system, right? It kind of decompresses, not decompresses, but I'll say the word decompresses the nervous system. It kind of brings us back to the parasympathetic nervous system because that's where it lives. The parasympathetic nervous system lives in the cranial aspect and the sacral aspects of our, of our head and spine. And so the sympathetic autonomic nervous system lives in our thoracic and lumbar area. And so how many of us are in sympathetic nervous system overdrive, right? We're type A, we're crazy, we're stressed out, we're, um, you know, we're just sympathetically driven and how much of us or how many of us have mid-back and lumbar spine issues, right? A ton. So this autonomic nervous system lives in that thoracic spine um, and so drives our neural input, which is going to drive our motor output. So it's important from that reason as well. And then simply structurally, it's a huge missing link, I think, when it gets locked down, it doesn't move properly, our ribs are attached to the thoracic spine. Now our ribs aren't moving well either. Um, and so we then, I'm gonna move here because the garbage truck is coming back. Coming back, oh my God. <laughs> and he is jacking up my mojo. <laughs> mojo! <laughs> <laughs> Um, so the thoracic spine, you know, if we can unlock that and get that thing moving better, then our lumbar spine doesn't have to try to make up for all the work, right? We get so much extra movement in our lumbar spine and that's where we see all of our herniated disc issues. Not that you can't get a herniated disc in your thoracic spine. Of course you can. And, and we see that in hockey players or golfers or people that have really powerful rotational movement, right? So you, of course, can herniate a disc anywhere in the area. But it's way more common to herniate or to have those kinds of structural issues in the lumbar spine. Why? Because it's trying to make up for what our, our thoracic spine hasn't been able to do, right? The lumbar spine, when we look at those facet joints, it's not set up really well for side bending. It's not set up well for rotation. Of course, there's a few degrees of movement um, that we get there, but, but anatomically, when we look at the structure, the lumbar spine's not set up to do anything very well outside of the sagittal plane. And so when we begin to introduce proper movement um, at the T-spine in the frontal plane and, and rotational movement at the C-spine, we begin to take some stress off that lumbar spine. And so we have to look upward. Let's go to that next that next slide. So, you know, how many times do we see the athlete um, on the right hand side? Like, you do not have to be a manual therapist or get your hands on that guy on the right to know that he has a really stiff T spine. Like, nothing is moving up there. And so, as a result, what does he have to do if he wants to move? He moves the thoracic spine towards the sacrum in order to do anything. And he creates these like mega sausage paraspinals, right? Like those things are like salamis. They are overused, right? Hypertrophy doesn't necessarily dictate strength, but it does give us an indication of use. And those paraspinals are used like crazy, as opposed to our little nugget there on the left, right? Like amazing hip mobility, amazing, you can't see his right arm, but if he's, he's propped up um, probably on that right elbow um, and he's pushing himself up onto that left hand, unbelievable stability in that scapula, unbelievable thoracic mobility, right? He's got a little bit of thoracic extension there um, and he's got to be able to, to hold himself up and his head is in an amazing spinal neutral. It's, it's an, an extension of his spine, right? It's not super far forward. Um, and so, you know, of course we're going to get older and we're going to change and so we're not going to move exactly like babies, but that's really where some of the DNS work that, that they do in Prague, everything kind of goes back to that neurodevelopmental movement from the first year of life because there's so much that we can learn from that first year of life and how if, if a baby has uh, a normally developed neurological system, 
um, what type of movement patterns they develop, and if they don't have a functioning, normally functioning um, neurodevelopmental system, what movement patterns don't develop, or um, what compensations develop. So we can learn so much from that time um, in our lives and, and relate it to adult orthopedic dysfunction, and that's, that's really where it, it gets cool somewhere between the picture on the left and you know 30 or 40 years later to the guy on the right something went horribly wrong in his movement pattern um, and I'm not suggesting that that's the same person but but I'm saying that this happens all the time people that have great movement when they're when they're babies end up like the picture on the right all the time mm -hmm. next slide So we see this concept over and over and over again in the athletes. And when we talk about a co-activation of things, right, and we talk about core stability, really to me, core stability isn't about abdominal work. Core stability is about creating this nice little canister of our torso and our trunk, right, and that our, our diaphragm is opposite of our pelvic floor. And so just like our abdominals are opposite to our paraspinals um, and we have our obliques on the side along with our transverse abdominus, we've got the diaphragm up top and the pelvic floor on the bottom and those things need to be in parallel. And when those things are in parallel and they can function in a co-active state, things are good, things are happy. It's when we begin to move to the guy on the right where we get an insane anterior pelvic tilt, our ribs flare out. Based on biomechanics alone, he has to function like a pair of scissors. The only place he can move is at that thoracolumbar junction. The only thing he can do is develop sausage pair spinals because they are overworking to get him to move and do everything possible. And so, yeah, can we do some abdominal work with him? Can we stretch out his hip flexors? Can we do anything from a fascial standpoint on the anterior line? Of course, all those things are good. But once we teach him how to balance out that diaphragm and that pelvic floor, that to me is where core stability comes in. Core stability to me is not about not letting the spine move. The spine is meant to move. It is meant to have controlled mobility. Um, core stability for me is having a nice co-activity of the diaphragm and the pelvic floor um, in order to really give some I guess, stabilization to the system so we do have a stable base to move from. A stable base to move from does not equate to a non-moving base to move from, if that makes sense. Next slide. Next slide. Slide. So great example. I see this all the time when I lay my athletes down, right? They get this crazy rib flare. And so, um, you know, what, what are they doing? Why are they doing it? Why? Because their diaphragm, right, begins to function in a paradoxical pattern, meaning when you look at, I, I've been studying a lot of the diaphragm stuff. I've been taking some of the, the, the Postural Restoration Institute stuff lately. Um, so they talk quite a bit about the diaphragm, um, which is interesting. And I have a, a freakish love affair with the diaphragm, so I love studying it. And when you look at it anatomically, um, you know, we've got that central tendon and that central tendon um, and the dome of that di uh, diaphragm is higher on the right than it is on the left. Um, and as we breathe, that diaphragm, it, it kind of acts like a jellyfish, right? And so the diaphragm attaches onto the ribs and onto the spine um, and it should be moving from the central tendon down and up, down and up. As we take in a breath uh, and we exhale, it should be moving from the central tendon. But people get inefficient with their, with their breathing, right? Our posture gets poor. We put ourselves in bad postures all the time. So now the body's got to figure it out. The body's, of course, always going to breathe. Um, and so it figures out a way to do it. So what does it do? It fixes that central tendon and now begins to move from its more distal portions, meaning the ribs and the, the spine begin to move. And so that's where we get that rib flare. And if we do it long enough, we're gonna change our structure. And so um, 
we have to be able to fix those paradoxical breathing patterns that we see in people. And again, for me, that's where core stability comes in comes into play. Um, the diaphragm does function uh, in some type of a, a stability role. It helps us from a stability standpoint. It fixes our ribs. It allows us to, to, to move our abdominals to transfer force um, across the torso, right? It's attached directly to the lumbar spine. The, the diaphragm goes all the way down. The height of the diaphragm goes up to T8. And the um, crust of the diaphragm or the ligaments of the diaphragm go all the way down to L3 from an anatomical structural standpoint. So it's of course going to affect the spine. And so um, one thing that I really focus on with the athletes is trying to get them out of that rib flare, right? Trying to get them out of that inspiratory position that they're stuck in with their chest. Um, again, that further driving the sympathetic nervous system, right? So as we begin to just take in a breath and we get stuck, right? Like that guy looks like he's taking in this big, deep breath. His belly goes in, which it should be going out if you're taking in a deep breath. Um, and as you exhale, that belly should come in a little bit, right? And our ribs should move. Um, but but the, the belly moves because of the ascension and the descension of the diaphragm. And so that person oftentimes gets stuck in an inspiratory position. And so we can really use expiration and forced expiration to help get those ribs back down, um, to help use that diaphragm in, in a more uh, appropriate way, um, to help with stability. When the body has to choose between stability and breath, it will always choose breath always. And so if we can help that body um, align and, and get the diaphragm with the pelvis in a better position, now we've got some core stability. And that's really where the power of the core comes from in my mind and in my practice. Next slide. The lumbar. 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 Um, okay, so let's go to the next one. We've kind of talked a lot about the structure of the lumbar spine. Um, you know, the abdominals for me are really, really interesting. And again, looking at structure of muscle, right? So when we look at um, the hamstrings, let's say, right, the hamstrings, obviously they do a lot of different things, but from a textbook, open chain, non super exciting type of an action, they simply flex the knee, right? If you, if you activate your hamstrings, you're going to get some knee flexion. So our, our abdominals, if we look at our rectus abdominus there, technically, again, on a non exciting, non super functional way, when you just move origin to insertion, it flexes the trunk. So we have one muscle that flexes the trunk and one muscle that flexes the knee. They look nothing alike, right? So the hamstrings don't have a linea alba. The hamstrings don't have those fascial um, sort of invaginations that go across the rectus abdominis, right? So why does the rectus have all of that fascia? Why does it have a linea alba? Why does it have the fascia that goes um, horizontally across it? Um, and for me, I think it's because from a function, right, if we look at the structure of the muscle, um, its function isn't really to flex the trunk. It, it does that, yes, origin to insertion, but it transfers force, right? Look at all that fascia when we start to look at the obliques and the, the external and internal obliques and the transverse abdominis. And now we look at, at the rectus as having these fascial um, things kind of running through it. It's about force transfer. That's what the core does for us, right? It's a transfer of force from the lower extremities to the upper extremities or vice versa. And so we have to be able to sort of look at structure sometimes and say, huh, well, that doesn't look like a bicep, right? My bicep flexes my elbow. Um, so there's something different with the rectus abdominis. And I think that's because it plays such an amazing role in force transfer. And that's really what the abdominals do for us. Let's go next one. Next one. Mm. Okay. Diaphragm. I didn't even realize I had that picture in here. That makes me so happy. Hey. Um, <laughs> so I love the diaphragm. I, we, I know I am not the only dork out there that has a favorite muscle. 
So it is my favorite muscle um, because it is exactly that. It's a muscle, right? When we look at it, there is that central tendon that goes all the way up to T8 and the cross of the diaphragm goes all the way down to L3. And when we look, I've been studying a lot of visceral manipulation work as well and how viscera will affect our musculoskeletal system too and, and, tra and translate into musculoskeletal pain, which is really interesting. There's a ligament that goes right around and it attaches the diaphragm from the lumbar spine, go, attaches the diaphragm around the esophagus um, and attaches back down on the other side of the lumbar spine. So we have, and that's called the ligament of treats. There is an actual ligament that connects the esophagus with our diaphragm and with our lumbar spine. I was blown away by that because how many of our athletes have digestive issues, right? And, and I'm extrapolating quite a bit because I don't have it figured out yet. However, we have an actual anatomical structure that connects our digestive system to our lumbar spine. How many people in our world are, you know, gluten intolerant or lactose intolerant and they have back pain and they have different issues, right? All these different musculoskeletal issues and they can't, you know, eat some pasta, like there's, there's got to be an anatomical structural connection there. And to me, that ligament of treats has been a really, really interesting anatomical finding um, that, that I had never paid attention to. So again, I don't have that one figured out. I just hugely extrapolated. However, um, I think there's something to it. And again, that diaphragm, like I said, it attaches onto the ribs and it attaches all the way down to L3 on the right side, L2 on the left side. Um, and there's even some, some anatomical references now that are, are taking that down even to L4. So it's, it's covering quite a bit of our lumbar spine. And we don't really think about the diaphragm affecting our lumbar spine, but there's a huge anatomical connection there. Go ahead, next, uh, next slide. And so... As we look again at anatomical connections, that lumbar, that diaphragm comes all the way down to L3 on the right side. Well, where does the psoas go up to? The psoas comes off of L1, L2, right? And goes down and crosses over our, our hip. So we have a direct anatomical connection with our diaphragm and our psoas, right? So how many of our athletes or clients or patients or whoever you're, whatever population you're working with, how many of them are we jamming our fingers into what is most likely their ascending or descending colon, um, but we're jamming our fingers in there in an attempt to quote unquote release their psoas, right? Because they've got tight hip flexors because um, their body is searching for stability, right? Their body is searching for tone. And when you have such an anatomical connection with your diaphragm, right? If your diaphragm, like I said, your diaphragm's got to choose between breath and stability, right? If we put it in a poor position. So it's always going to choose breath. It's always going to choose life, which means something else has to make up for the stability, which means our psoas gets all toned up because it's trying to stabilize uh, in an area that it, it's not supposed to do, right? That's not what it's necessarily supposed to do. And so um, the psoas gets toned up. We jam our fingers in there to try to release the hip flexors. Um, and then, you know, we, we go on from there and we do a bunch of abdominal exercises. And so for me, looking at the structure of how the diaphragm and the psoas really relate changed how I deal with it from a functional standpoint uh, with my athletes. Um, because if I can give the system some stability back by properly positioning the diaphragm and the pelvic floor, that psoas can let go. It doesn't need my, it doesn't need my fingers being jammed into it. Um, it's toned up for a reason. And if I take away that tone, I've got to give stability back into the system somewhere else. So that has really, for me, changed my approach to what probably traditionally is called a core stability program. Let's go next slide. Um, yeah, so that diaphragm, again, kind of functions like a double-sided tape, right? So as we inhale, the diaphragm actually flattens out a bit. As we exhale, the diaphragm gets domed up. And so once the diaphragm gets domed up, right? It's almost like a plyometric for the diaphragm, right? We have to, we know the stretch shorten cycle, which is what plyometrics are, right? If we utilize the stretch shorten uh, cycle well, 
we can create a lot of power. We can create a lot of force, right? We can, we become more elastic and we move better with more power. Well, if the diaphragm always stays in that position on the left, right? We stay stuck in an inspiratory position with our ribs. Um, we excite our sympathetic nervous system because we're constantly in that inspiratory position. So we're jamming, uh, we're jamming into the sympathetic nervous system. So we're all stressed out. Um, if we exhale, if we forcefully exhale, that's going to dome up the diaphragm, right? And if we can dome up the diaphragm, then it can properly inhale and then exhale again and inhale. But if it always stays flattened, we can't have that proper sort of exchange of oxygen and exchange of gases, right? And so then that, that kind of comes into play from a fatigue standpoint um, and from a tissue healing standpoint. If we're, not, if we're not utilizing our lungs to the full capacity, we're not exchanging gases to our best capacity. So that stuff is really important from a healing standpoint and from a fatigue standpoint. So how many of us are constantly tired all the time? You know, it starts to relate to some of the structure stuff. Go ahead and, and next slide. Next slide. <clears throat> next slide. So basically, same, you know, that this slide is basically saying the exact same thing here is that that diaphragm um, needs to get domed up in order to flatten back down. And so it's a really nice balance of inspiration and expiration. Next slide. Next slide. <laughs> Actually, I just said all that. Next slide. <laughs> There we go. I told you I could talk on any of these slides for a really, really long time. <laughs> um, and so, you know, again, I'm just kind of getting into some of the, the PRI stuff, but um, it is interesting. A lot of times we do see um, a rib hump on the left and, and that, that totally fits me, right? And it goes back to that picture of the diaphragm having a bigger dome on the right and we tend to be a little bit flatter on the left. Um, we have the crust of the diaphragm uh, on the right goes down to L3. It's a bigger, thicker ligament than on the left side, right? So everything is sort of pulling that pelvis into right rotation. Um, and so we have to compensate with that by doing a left rotation up top. If we didn't, we'd be facing, you know, off to the side. Um, and so because of that, we end up getting a little bit of a left rib flare. And so, um, it's been really interesting to study the PRI stuff. I, I started to take some PRI stuff five, six years ago, and, and, and I've had this conversation with, with, with my teacher, James Anderson, who is an unbelievable person and unbelievable teacher. I told him, I was like, dude, I hated PRI five or six years ago. I didn't understand it. It was super dogmatic. I had to learn a whole new language, um, and I just couldn't, it couldn't resonate in my practice. The way he's teaching it now is very kind of anatomical based, and I'm like, Oh, yeah, I get that. The diaphragm is bigger on the right. Oh, yeah, I get that. Okay, that, that's cool. That, that There is some asymmetries in, in our bodies here, um, simply from being human. And so how do we, how do those structural asymmetries delve into different functions? And so I've, I've been playing with that concept. I don't have it all worked out in my head yet. Um, but it is interesting to see some of these patterns over and over and over again uh, and people simply because we're all human. That we people. are. Well, some, some. Most of us are. <laughs> <laughs> next, next slide. Yes, next slide. I think we're getting to the end, hopefully. So that leaves some time for questions. Um, mm, the hip. So, you know, the hip plays such a huge role in the lumbar spine. And so, again, as we said, um, lumbar spine, not well set up for rotation. Uh, it's set up really, really well for sagittal plane motion, not set up well for rotation. Um, however, our hips are made for rotation uh, amazingly. And so that's really where our rotation needs to come from. It needs to come from, um, it needs to come from our, our hips, right? It's not, it's not coming from our, our lumbar spine. Um, and so that is where hip dysfunction is going to come into play when we're talking about low back dysfunction. Next slide. Uh, uh, next slide. Next one again, okay. Yeah, so next slide. Um, 
Ah, the lat. I love the lat. It, it runs a close second in my heart to the diaphragm for sure. Um, the lat is a freakish muscle. Check it out. It goes all the way through the thoracolumbar dorsal fascia, right? All the way down, attaches onto our ilium, and then it directly attaches. It dives underneath our humerus and attaches to the front of our arm. Like, are, are you kidding me? There's a muscle that goes from our hip to our arm. Like, that's out of control for me. And so when that, you know, when that um, fascial connection gets gets broken down or disturbed or or whatever it may be. Um, I just think it's really cool from a functional standpoint to see that like, hey, we've got this amazing structure that literally connects our hips to our arm. That's pretty cool. Next slide. Uh, one more. So the visceral stuff, I've been doing a lot of studying of visceral work as well. Um, and this has been really, really cool too. And how our viscera actually relate to um, and attach in, in our bodies, right? So we care so much about fascia, right? And again, like I said, I've been studying Luigi Stecco stuff and, you know, everybody's foam rolling and doing all this stuff, which I think is great. Um, but, you know, like we foam roll our legs, right? We foam roll our arms. And so we've got all this fascia from our feet to our hips. Then we sort of skip the entire trunk and we pick it up again in the arms, right? Well, what do we think is connected from our pelvis to our shoulder girdle? It's all fascia, right? And we have all of our organs in there and our organs are suspended and connected to our torso through fascia. And so really looking at the, I was, I gotta tell you, when I started taking some visceral stuff, I was in the kind of a weird place in my, in my career and just not in the mood for woo woo. And day one, I was looking at my friend that I went with and I was like, I am going to kill you for bringing me here. I don't want to play. Can you feel it? Like, can I feel the liver move for four days? Like I'm going to kill you. But by the end of the four days, I was signing up for the next course because it was really, really cool. And you know how they got me was by wine. He was like, well, <laughs> can you, that's how he got me. Cause I was like, you can't feel this stuff. Like this is ridiculous. And he's like, well, can you tell the difference between a white and a red wine? I'm like, yeah, of course. And he's like, okay, well, can you tell the difference between a Sauvignon Blanc and a Chardonnay? I'm like, yeah. And he's like, can you tell the difference between a Sauvignon Blanc from California and a Sauvignon Blanc from New Zealand? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, okay, so if you can tell the difference in your palate between those things, why can't you, why can't you feel different things with your palpation? And I was like, Hmm. Okay. You got me. I'm on, I'm on board. And so that's what I kind of opened up my mind of like, okay, I've got to pay attention to some of these, right? Cause organs, right. I'm a musculoskeletal therapist. I'm a sports physical therapist. I'm a, I'm a performance coach, right? I deal with muscles. I do You know, I don't deal with organs. Um, and so organs are weird for us to think about, but how do we think they're suspended and attached in our body? They're attached through fascia. What is the fascia attached to? It attaches to our spine and to our abdominals and to our ribs. And so we have to pay attention to that. And, and the beauty is we don't have to be experts in all this stuff, right? We just have to be aware that it's out there and it exists and just acknowledge it and know that like when our, you know, we all have that patient or that athlete or that client who like gets better, right? They get better. They get 75% better, 80% better. They're doing good. But that last 10%, that last 20%, something's not coming along. Hmm. It might be one of these other interesting things. The great thing is most people fit within that bell curve, right? It's a bell curve. Most people are going to get better with our interventions, right? A lot of times, especially the healthy population in general that I work with, I just kind of got to stay out of their way. They're healthy males from, you know, the age of 18 to 36. Uh, chances are they're going to get better if I just stay out of their way. But, you know, can we get them better faster? Can we get those people that are on the that end of the bell curve that, that aren't getting better, can we get them better with some of these other structural things that really, quite frankly, I ignored for the first 20 years of my career? Next slide. Oh my gosh, we're coming up on an hour. What is happening? Um, <laughs> You're enjoying yourself. That's what <laughs> I told you. Don't get me started. <laughs> um, and these are just some examples, right, of how some of the ligaments are suspended. You know how 
how our heart is attached to our spine and to our ribs and how our colon is attached to our ribs. Um, just some really, really interesting structural stuff that, that, you know, don't go too far down the rabbit hole, but it is some interesting stuff for you to take a peek at. Next slide. Oh, there, oh my gosh, I totally didn't even remember that I put the ligament of treats in there. That is my oh. favorite ligament. Check it out. It, it, it's really amazing at how, so there you guys can kind of see, there's the esophagus, there's the crust of the diaphragm, right? And that ligament of treats um, goes right up and over uh, on the esophagus. So it really, I mean, there's got to be some type of a connection here with all the digestive issues that my athletes and clients are dealing with um, and with their back pain and with their paradoxical breathing pattern and with all sort of the musculoskeletal things that they're feeling. I think it's, I think it's an interesting thing to, to think about. That, that ligament of treats, you can see it, it's written as the suspensory muscle of the duod uh, duodenum, ligament of treats. So it's, and again, attaching our small intestine, wrapping it around and attaching it into the diaphragm. Like, that's cool, right? Seb, am I being a dork? I'm kind of being a dork. Next you're, slide. You're, you're being a super mega dork, though. It's all good. <laughs> Let's go to the next slide. I know we're coming up on an hour, so I wanted to leave people some time for, for questions or whatnot. Um, this just is some of the, the visceral research, um, you know, because they, they are researching it, and there is some cool stuff out there. And so, um, anyway, I guess the point of my, the point of my talk and the, the name of my company, like, it all just comes back to the structure and function. It's not necessarily which came first, but they're just so intertwined. And, and sometimes in our, in our paradigm shifts, we get so shifted one direction towards functional movement and functional exercise, and I love all that stuff. Um, but when we begin to relate function, function to structure, like that's when we can really sort of see some of the other cool structural things kind of come out. Truck. No. Truck. <laughs> <laughs> like Wayne's World's car. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, so that's, that's really kind of where my brain's been at is, is kind of connecting these concepts of structure and function and, and anatomy and movement and sort of how, how these things really intertwine. Mega, mega. And then there we go. We got some contact details for you as well. There's me. You can see I was really, really original in all my social media handles. It, it makes things simple because <laughs> I have a couple of different ones, and I, I so lost, so lost in what I use. <laughs> I was putting together that I was like, wow, that's sort of unoriginal, Sue. But yeah, like you said, it keeps things simple. <laughs> <laughs> Mega stuff. Well, Sue, thank you very much, guys. Let's get some questions. If anybody's got some questions, do please type it in now. But as you are doing that, as some of you know, um, it's a little bit slow from when you type and when I receive it. Just so you guys know, if you want to know more about Sue and her work, of course, there's the episode of the podcast we did, the Strength Mass podcast episode 66. But also, Sue was very, very kind, and I'm so thankful for this. Sent me a couple of DVDs of her work. Uh, Yay! The one, yeah, I've got them right here in front of me. The one being the cervical thoracic junction, the missing link in, re in relieving shoulder tension and neck pain, and the other, the shoulder, implications for the overhead athlete and beyond. And you can find out more and get your own copies of these at otpbooks.com. And as well as, I think you can hear more of uh, Sue's talks and lectures on movementlectures.com as well, guys. Um, so incredible. And of course, there's all her contact information. If you would like to reach out, I think everyone's brains may be melting out of their ears, Sue, because there seems to be no questions coming in. If you've got no <laughs> questions, guys, do please show your appreciation. Do let me know in our comment section here on the right hand side of the screen. Oh, there we go. One from Karen. Sue, thanks so much for being here. Wow. So much great stuff. Thank you, Karen, for being here. And I do agree with you as well. It is some great stuff. We are very lucky and extremely lucky that Sue has given up a hell of a lot of time to do this one hour's chat with us. So, guys, please do show your appreciation. I'm very thankful for you. If there are no questions to Sue or as we got there, there's some contact details. Maybe if you're lucky, she will reply to some emails. I know she's a very busy lady. But do let us know on Facebook as well, guys, on the Strength Matters Hub page. Do please let me know what you did think of this webinar and as well as many other webinars as well that we have done. I do appreciate your feedback. If you would like to send me some in private, 
you can do at seb at realstrengthmatters.com. We got a question, but let me read out a couple of things. So Jill says, um, with respect to overhead athletes, do you see much difference in issues with swimmers versus throwers? Um, you know, that's a good question. It's, a, it's hard for me to say because I, I don't work with a lot of swimmers. Um, so it's hard for me to, to really compare the two. Um, but depending on their stroke, I would imagine they're going to be a little bit more bilateral versus, um, you know, unilateral. Usually people are only going to throw with one arm, but you know, depending on their stroke, they may have bilateral issues. So a lot of times when there's bilateral things, I tend to look more central, meaning sometimes those bilateral shoulder issues are stemming from cervical or thoracic spine. So, um, that would be my biggest advice there is to just sort of look centrally um, to see what is sort of happening bilaterally, if that makes sense. Cool, cool. And just a few comments from Stephen, Aaron, Clark, and Jim all saying thank you. Excellent. Really enjoyed it. Great webinar. Excellent stuff. And then we do have a question from Karen, um, a question about frozen shoulder. Any ideas for helping someone in the thawing stage? Oh, yeah. Frozen shoulder stinks. Um, no, again, not a diagnosis I typically see. I mean, my demographic really is men from 18 to 36. Like, that's really what I work with. Um, so it's hard for me to extrapolate sometimes. A frozen shoulder is a miserable diagnosis for sure. Um, and I, you know, I teach dry needling. That is another major thing of what I do. And so, um, I have had feedback from my students that, that dry needling and cupping, um, have been helpful in that, in that stage. Um, I don't have personal experience with it, but that's what my students have been telling me. Um, so if you've got access to, to someone who does dry needling, um, or cupping in your area, that might be something to consider and look into. Cool, cool. And again, a few comments from Mark, Carlo, and Jill saying, thank you, Sue. Thanks so much. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you guys for joining us for this opportunity. And of course, really, it does all go to Sue. Thank her for the great opportunity coming here. Um, Mandy, for you, you've asked me to repeat the name of the DVD. It is Sue Falzoni, The Cervical Thoracic Junction, The Missing Link in Revealing Shoulder Tension and Neck Pain. Do let me know if you got that or if you want me to repeat it again. Karen, excellent. Thank you. Thanks, Sue. And of course, thank you, Karen. Um, Quark, I'm sorry, pal, if I am butchering your name. I really do apologize. Um, where do you teach dry needling, Sue? Um, if you go to my website, systemicdryneedling.com, my classes are up there where I'm teaching. I've got, um, I just taught one in January. I think I've got four or five on the schedule and I've got another three that should be scheduled in the fall. So there's, there's some upcoming courses for sure. Just go to my website, systemicdryneedling.com. Cool. And as you can see on the screen, just in front of us, guys, is all the social networking and website details for Sue as well. Uh, Mandy, you've got it. Fantastic. Um, I can't wait to actually dig into these DVDs. Really, really looking forward to it. I just, I need time because I know I'm going to be rewinding back a few seconds just to catch every tiny little detail. Uh, guys, in the future, we do have some great webinars lined up and as well as podcast episodes lined up as well. Uh, a very exciting one with a gentleman from NASA we recorded yesterday. Again, guys, please get in touch. Please give us your feedback, um, negative or, or positive. It helps us help you because we're here for the community. Um, Sue, I cannot thank you enough. Guys, thank you for coming to join us. Really hope you learned something. And this webinar will be up within our group's page within a week. Um, so from there, guys, do leave comments on the Facebook page. And I shall hopefully hear from you all soon. Good from Sue and myself, beg your pardon. Goodbye.